Thank you very much, Aisha, and thank you to everyone for the introduction. Um, can you hear me? Okay, at the back? Yes. yes, good. Excellent. Really pleased to be here today to talk to you about epigenetics, um, because it's a great topic. And one of the reasons it's such a great topic is because it's transforming our understanding of biology. It's taking us in whole new directions to understand complex things about human behavior, and it's also answering some really fundamental questions that we used to know existed, but we pretended were unimportant because we didn't know how to address them. And one of the first things that I like about epigenetics is that it tells us that our DNA is not always our destiny. In fact, most of the time it isn't, and there's a reason why. And I'm going to spend about the next 40 minutes giving you some examples of why this is the case. So it's called epigenetics, and that kind of means we have to talk about genetics first, just a little bit. So here is a representation of the famous DNA double helix. And the double helix, our genome, our DNA script, is a script that's made from just four letters, A, C, G, and T. But we have, the, we have so many of these that it creates an extraordinary huge script, something that if you write it down, in, if you type it out in books, would, it fills a bookshelf about two meters high and about a meter and a half wide. Because we inherit a huge amount of DNA from our parents. So half our DNA comes from our parents, half our DNA comes, uh, sorry, half comes from our mother, half comes from our father. Can any of you remember how many base pairs, A, C, G, and T, we inherit from our mother or from our father? The size of the human haploid genome. Have a guess. Shout a number. 23 is the number of pairs of chromosomes, so you're heading in the right direction. But how many actual base pairs? Okay, never expected it to be that lively a question. <laughs> you inherit 3,000 million base pairs from your mother. Okay, some of you are pleased, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and 3,000 million from your father. 3 billion base pairs. And sometimes all it takes is one of those to be wrong. One out of 3 billion you can have a devastating disease, something like Lesh Nyhan's disease. In Lesh Nyhan's disease, the boys who are affected have to be restrained their entire lives because otherwise they bite through their own lips and they bite through their own fingers, screaming with pain as they do so. Because one out of three billion base pairs is wrong. So genetics is really important, but most of us are lucky we haven't got a devastating mutation like that. Our DNA sequence works pretty well. And back in 2001, the first human genome sequence was released. And this was a huge deal. Before then, we didn't know the sequence of all the base pairs in the human genome. And there was this enormous press conference, and the great and the good stood up and said really quite dumb things. Um, so Bill Clinton, who was then president of the United States, said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. Michael Dexter, the chair of the Wellcome Trust, the great British charity that funds medical research in this, council, in this country, described the sequencing of the human genome as the single greatest achievement in the history of humanity. Now, both of them had gone a bit mad at that point. These, they're not, it's not really true, but it was a very big deal. Um, part of the reason they said all these slightly over-the-top things was actually because the human genome sequence was sold as being the experiment that would answer all questions. Okay? And it cost an awful lot of money. Back then, it cost something like two to three billion dollars to sequence the human genome. You can now get it done for a thousand pounds. So it was a very big deal, and we really needed to know the human genome sequence. It's opened up huge amounts of work, huge amounts of fascinating science. But actually, every scientist in the world knew that the human genome sequence wasn't the answer to everything. And that's because of this 
things that we call epigenetic phenomena, and I'll explain the word a bit better in a minute. We've known for about 100 years that you can create mice which are genetically absolutely identical. You don't have to do cloning or anything like that, you just do inbreeding. And eventually, after multiple inbred crosses, you get mice which are genetically absolutely the same as each other. And you can keep them under identical laboratory conditions. So you've controlled their genes and their environment. And yet the mice are not the same. The mice will vary in things like body weight, for example. And we had no explanation why. And it was such a well-established phenomenon that if you said to a scientist, these mice have the same genes and the same environment, why aren't they the same as each other? The answer you would get would be, ah, oh, well, it's a case of intangible variation. Intangible variation, it sounds really scientific. It's just a classic example of what we do all the time in biology. If we don't understand something, we give it a really fancy name, and then we pretend, okay? So intangible variation, you have to watch out for this in biology a lot. If you look at a maggot and a fly, and sadly I'm such a geek that I do tend to, I actually sit at home with a microscope in the evenings, it's very sad. If you look at a maggot and a fly, they differ from each other enormously. I mean, the maggot only has a couple of pairs of spindly little legs, it just crawls along, etc. The fly, you all know what a fly looks like. They're completely different from each other, but they have the same genome, they must have. A maggot, when it pupates to turn into a fly, doesn't get a whole new set of genes delivered. So there's something odd happening there. If I were to take DNA from this young woman and DNA from this young man, don't look so worried, I'm not going to, okay? <laughs> and I sequence the DNA, I would be able to tell which came from you and which came from you. Because in mammals, gender is determined by genetics. You will have two X chromosomes. You will have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. By the way, never ever use this example if you're working in quite a dark lecture theatre. Because I once did this with the audience. You will have two X, you will have an X and Y. Turned out they were both men. It was really embarrassing. <laughs> it's awful. It never really recovered from that point on, to be honest. Anyway. In mammals, gender is determined genetically. It's not in crocodiles. If I take, very, very carefully, DNA from a male crocodile and a female crocodile, and I sequence it, I can't tell which was which. Gender in crocodiles is determined by the temperature at which the eggs incubate. All of these examples are things known as epigenetic phenomena. And what this means is two things are the same genetically, but they are a different phenotype. And epi just comes from the Greek. Epi means at, on, in addition to, as well as. So what this is saying is basically that there are situations where something else is operating as well as the genetic code. There's something else as well as our DNA or every other organism's DNA, which is important. Now, I think these are really fun examples of epigenetic phenomena, but there is a much better one actually in this room at the moment. In fact, I would guess there's about 150, 170, because it's all of us. We are all masterpieces of epigenetics. Normally, I ask how many cells in the human body, but given how animated you got about um, the number of bases in the genome, I'm not going to. I'm going to tell you. There's a, between 30 and 50 trillion cells in each of your bodies. That's an extraordinary number of cells, and they form hundreds of different cell types. But the really weird thing is that with the exception of a tiny percentage of those cells which are in our immune system, all of those cells have exactly the same DNA sequence. They're all absolutely identical, and they're all identical to the zygote, that single cell from which each of us originated. But how on earth can that be? How on earth can it be that we have 200 different cell types, but they all have the same DNA, and those cell types know to remain as the correct cell types? How can it be that the skin cells only ever give rise to more skin cells? 
The kidney cells only ever give rise to more kidney cells. Never changes. You do not ever get bits of bone developing in your liver. You never, ever, ever get teeth appearing in your eyeballs, happily. Okay? Never happens. Our cells know what to do. So that's an epigenetic phenomenon. But if you're working in science and if you're working in biology, the questions you should always be asking are the how and the why questions. How can this be the case? How can a single genome code for so many different phenotypes? Well, I think a helpful way to think of this is um, that the genome is like a script, okay? Like a script for a play or a film. Some of you, despite studying science, have probably either volunteered or more likely been forced to be in school drama productions. And you'll have gone through the rehearsal process where you've got the script in front of you, and either with your classmates or with a drama teacher who's inflicting this torture on you, you have to annotate the script. You make pencil notes on it, or you, certain lines get crossed out, or you put post-it notes on reminding you of the, screen, of the stage directions. That's kind of what happens to our DNA. Our DNA gets additional information added to it that in skin cells tells the DNA how to code for everything that's required for skin. A different set of stage directions on the liver cells. So it's very like having two productions of a Shakespeare script. Black and white one is from the 1930s. Okay? Used Shakespeare's script for Romeo and Juliet. The color version is from the 1990s. It's the one with Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. Also use Shakespeare's script. But the two productions look completely different. That is what our cells are doing all the time. And I think all of that's very interesting, but it only gets us so far. If that was all that we knew about, I wouldn't be here talking to you, because I wouldn't have enough to talk about for the rest of the talk. But something has changed particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. You're probably guessing already I like old movies, and this old movie is um, the movie called The Time Machine. It was made in the 1960s. Um, and anyone who's a fan of the Big Bang Theory will also have seen that time machine. Yes, very good, you'd already spotted that, um, which is in one of the earlier episodes of the Big Bang Theory. Now, that's our time traveler, right? And in the movie, there's a scene quite early on where he's built a little model of the time machine he's planning to make. And he, it's set in Edwardian England, and he gets all his mates around with their top hats on and stuff, and he says to them, this is going to be a time machine. This is a model of what a time machine will be. And they look a bit skeptical, as well you might, and they say, well, how would a time machine work? And he says, well, the time traveler will sit in that seat. And when they want to move into the future, they'll push the lever forwards. And if they want to travel into the past, they'll pull the lever backwards. And all the blokes in the top hat nod and go, hmm, as if he's explained it. But of course, he hasn't explained it. All he's done is describe it. And up until 15 years ago, most of what we could do with epigenetics was to describe epigenetic things happening. The reason epigenetics is such a fruitful area of biology now is we're starting to understand the explanation. How do these things happen? And we're starting to understand them at the molecular level. And to understand that, you have to understand what DNA is really like in our cells. It's always presented as this long, stringy double helix like an incredibly long set of wavy railroad tracks. But it can't actually be like that. You see, if you take the DNA out of a cell and you stretch it out, it would be very, very thin, but it would be about two meters long. But it's got to fit into a nucleus which is about a thousandth of a millimeter in diameter. DNA in cells has to be structured, otherwise it can't fit in the nucleus and it would get tangled and then you'd have breaks, and then you'd have rejoinings, and then you'd have things like cancer developing. So this is what DNA really looks like in a cell. Not colored, obviously, but this was done a while back, and this will not project onto there. Okay, basically, I'm gonna do the old point and jump thing. Here's the DNA, right, the double helix. And what you have is 147 base pairs of DNA, 
wrapped around eight proteins, which are those coils in the middle. And those proteins are called histones. They're shaped kind of like a fist, and every one of those histone proteins, those eight histone proteins, has a tail that sticks out beyond the DNA. So what you have are 147 base pairs wrapped around those eight histone proteins, and then the DNA continues for a little bit, a few hundred or so base pairs, and then another 147 base pairs of DNA are wrapped around the histone proteins, and on and on and on. And there are millions of these clusters of DNA and histone proteins in cells. <clears throat> now, this work up here, to do all the structural biology and the X-ray crystallography and all the other techniques they used and the huge amounts of computing, this took big teams of scientists years to do, and it cost millions of dollars. And it's a beautiful piece of science. But it's not that helpful from the point of view of someone like me who likes to communicate about science. Partly because this image is a bit overwhelming and partly because it's extremely difficult for me to amend this image to show you the things I want to show you. Okay? So I decided, in the spirit of public communication, to create my own version of this. Okay? And it had several advantages. I try to be modest, but it is much more useful. Okay? So mine did not cost me millions of dollars, nor take many, many years. Very easy for me to amend it and then photograph it to create the images I need to show you. And once I'd done all that, it had a particular advantage, which was that I was able to eat it, well, which for me is a real triumph, because my version of this is made from strawberry laces, marshmallows, jelly tots. Okay? Um, they always say, what's your most important take-home message in a talk? Well, mine is, if you haven't had jelly tots for ages, have them again. They're really, really good. I do like jelly tots. So here we go. Um, incidentally, this model always goes down really, really well. But the exception was when I was, um, I was giving a talk at a conference in Wales. And it was just as I started to project this, I realized it was a room full of dentists who were not quite so, as impressed by my model as I hoped they might be. Um, anyway, the DNA is going to be represented by the strawberry laces. OK? We shall not try to make it double-stranded. That would be silly. The marshmallows represent those eight histone proteins. And what you can see here are eight histones with the cocktail sticks, which cunningly represent those tails that I told you stick out. OK? So here we go. DNA <coughs> wrapped around eight histone proteins. DNA carries on a bit, wraps around eight histone proteins. I would have made the model bigger, but I'd already eaten quite a lot of the components by this stage. So that's the basics. All well and good, but how does that help us understand different patterns of gene expression? Well, let's imagine the following scenario. I'm sure you're all very into clean eating and being uber healthy, etc. But let's just try to imagine a different world. Let's imagine a world in which you know, you're all revising, you're all stressed, etc. Yes, yeah, sounding familiar. And each evening, you get home and you're really fed up and you just need something to cheer yourself up a bit. So you have a jam donut because everybody feels better if they've had a jam donut. Oh, quite a lot of people nodding. Okay. And this goes on and on and on. And at first, when you have a jam donut, it gives you that fabulous sugar high about half an hour later. Quite soon, you're discovering you don't quite get that same energy boost from the jam donut, and that's when you find yourself on the slippery slope of the two jam donuts. Okay? Here's what's happening. You're piling an awful lot of sugar into your system. That's why jam donuts taste so good. Um, and signaling cascades are set up. Um, one of the cascades that's set up in response to all this sugar is in the liver. And basically, there's an awful lot of sugar coming into the system. So the li sorry, not the liver, the pancreas. So the cells in the pancreas, in the islets of Langerhans, have to produce more insulin. Okay? The signaling cascades result in tiny chemical modifications being added to the histone tails. I've shown these with the green jelly tots, okay? And what this does. Having all those green jelly tots there in the vicinity of the insulin gene leads to higher expression of the insulin gene. 
Because what happens is other proteins come along, can recognize the green jelly tots, they bind, more complexes are set up, and ultimately you get more RNA polymerase too. That switches on the insulin gene, transcribes it a lot more vigorously. Okay? Now, let's say you're done with your exams, it's the summer holidays, and it does begin to dawn on you after a little while that the jam donuts may not be quite as healthy and nutritious as you were hoping and you stop eating the jam donuts, okay? Now you're doing the classic holiday thing of, you know, healthy food, letting your mothers and fathers cook for you, all that kind of thing, lots of vegetables, blah, blah, blah. No point your pancreas creating huge amounts of insulin now because there's not much, more, much sugar coming into the system. It would just be a waste to produce large amounts of insulin. So what happens is that different set of signaling cascades are set up those green jelly tots that basically help to switch the gene on, those modifications are removed. Another set of modifications is added, represented by the purple jelly tots, my personal favorites. Okay? Different proteins bind to those purple jelly tots. Proteins that create a complex that tends to repel RNA polymerase too. So you get less gene expression. So this is a way that your cells can use epigenetic modifications, because that's what these are, to change the level of expression of genes, okay? It's like a volume switch, and it allows your cells to respond to their environment and to set up quite long-term patterns if they want to of, of response. Now, sometimes, if there's a lot of these repressive modifications, the purple jelly tots, what also happens is that attracts other enzymes that come along and put a modification onto the DNA itself represented by the yellow jelly tots. And that makes for an even more repressive environment. It's even harder to switch that gene on. There are parts of our genome where you get incredibly high levels of modification of the DNA itself. The modification of the DNA is almost always methylation. It's one carbon, three hydrogens. When you get very high levels of methylation of the DNA, the entire region can actually be spatially distorted. It gets compressed and compacted. It forms what we call heterochromatin. And when that happens, that gene can never be switched on, really. Incredibly difficult to switch it on. This is what happens when cells start to differentiate, when we move from being a one-celled zygote to this 50 trillion wonderful cells cells start going down different differentiation pathways. So the neurons in your brain never need to express hemoglobin, the pigment that carries oxygen around in your blood. So the cells of the brain, as they're developing, this pattern of epigenetic modifications gets set up at the hemoglobin genes. And that region becomes compacted and is never switched on in the brain. Of course, in red blood cell precursors, there'll be a completely different set of genes which get switched off this way. So epigenetic modifications, these modifications to DNA and to the histone proteins, what those do is they can allow genes to be switched off for a lifetime, so they can act like an on-off switch, or they can be like the ones on the histones, which actually mean that a gene might be switched on, and it might be switched on a little, or it can be switched on a lot. So we have an on and off switch and a volume switch. The modifications are known as epigenetic modifications because same reason as for the phenomena. They're epigenetic. They act on in addition to the DNA. They never change what the DNA codes for. And what is unusual about them is they can be inherited as cells divide. So that's why skin cells only give rise to more skin cells, because they pass on the same pattern of epigenetic modifications. This is really important in basic biology, especially developmental biology. It's also incredibly important in health and disease. I worked for a long time on developing new drugs to treat cancer. And targeting abnormal epigenetic processes is a really good way of doing this. So it's really influencing, for example, drug companies are now spending billions of dollars trying to create new drugs. It may also underlie some really fundamental issues of human health that we've never been able to get a proper handle on. If you go into a bookshop, you can actually go up to the assistant and you can say, could you please direct me to the tragic life stories section? And they can, okay? 
which I find extraordinary. This is this whole genre called the misery memoirs. And the most famous one is this one, A Child Called It, which is in the New York bestseller list for six years. The misery memoirs, the tragic life stories, all follow the same story arc. A child has a terrible, abusive, neglectful upbringing, and somehow they overcome that to become a happy and successful adult. I'm not entirely sure why these sorts of stories are so popular, but I think one of the reasons is because actually we know that that happy ending is quite unusual. Um, the Jesuits, the order of Catholic priests, used to have an expression which, badly translated, basically means, show, give me a child until they're seven and I will show you the man. What they knew was that really early life experiences have an incredible impact on who we become as an adult. All the sociological data show that children who have a terrible early upbringing are at much higher risk than the general population of mental health disorders as adults, suicide risk as adults, various forms of addiction as adults. But if you say to somebody, why is that the case? Why is someone still having a terrible time in their 30s, 40s, 50s because of something that happened when they were seven? The answer you're almost always given is, well, they were psychologically damaged by their early life experiences which is undoubtedly true. But it's not an explanation, it's a description. And we can't study this in humans. It's both scientifically and ethically impossible. But you can study it in rodents, okay? Particularly in baby rats. So, what baby rats like is to be loved, okay? The way that a baby rat feels loved is that its mother licks and grooms it a lot. And some rat mothers are great, they lick and groom all their offspring, and some rat mothers are a bit feckless and they're really rubbish at licking and grooming. So let's take a baby rat that's been licked and groomed a lot. It's feeling very happy, it's a loved rat, okay? Loved baby rat. Now, after a few weeks, baby rats will leave their mothers, okay? They are not like all of you. They will not hang around till 30 hoping for a deposit for a flat, okay? They will leave their mothers. So you take the baby rat that was licked and groomed, loved a lot, and you let it grow up to be an adult, and you give it a mildly stressful stimulus. And it doesn't care. It's completely chilled about it. It is the whatever rat. But if you take a baby rat that was not licked and groomed, that was not loved, and you let it grow up, and you give it the same mildly stressful stimulus, it jumps out of its skin. It's a highly stressed rat. And the responses are absolutely purely driven by the early nurturing events, because you can actually cross foster the babies at birth onto good or bad mothers. And their response as adults is entirely dependent on how they were reared. Now we can see that that has some analogies to the human situation. We also know that the very stressed baby rats have very high baseline levels of the stress hormones stress hormones like cortisol. That's very consistent with what we find in adults who had abusive upbringings. What seems to be happening is that, excuse me, when the baby rats are licked and groomed and loved a lot, they produce large amounts of serotonin, the happiness neurotransmitter. And this sets up a particular pattern of epigenetic modifications at certain key genes in certain cells of the brain and particularly in the hypothala hypothalamus and the pituitary. Those modifications are basically ones that result in particular patterns of gene expression that keep the background levels of stress hormones really low. Those patterns get established and maintained in the neurons, and they influence the behavior in the adult rats. So that's a really nice model of what might be happening in the children who are abused that actually their brains are being set epigenetically to respond to a stress environment. And even if they're no longer in that stress environment, they can't adapt. And so they are at high levels of various mental health disorders, high level risk. Which is kind of interesting, but makes sense. But let's have a look at something really odd now. We'll have a bit of a change of tack. Here are some really nice animals, a 
particularly magnificent stick insect, a zebrafish, rather gorgeous salamander. My personal favourites, the Komodo dragons, and zebra finches. All of these species, which represent all the major classes of the animal kingdom apart from mammals, can do something that mammals can't. The zebra finch, it's a really controversial example, but it does seem to be the case. Have you any idea what all of these animals can do that, hum that mammals can't? OK, I'm going to assume somebody said the right thing. All of them, the females, can create live young without ever, ever having mated. Parthenogenesis. Mammals, the, the zebra finch one is really controversial, but it seems to be the case. Mammals can't do that. They just can't. And actually, if you say, why can't mammals do this? The explanation used to be, well, they can't, which of course is not an explanation. It's just restating what we know. So back in the 1990s, a fantastic scientist in Cambridge called Azim Sarani did a beautifully elegant set of experiments. He took a mouse egg and he took out the nucleus. And then he injected two egg nuclei from other mice and put that egg back into a female mouse. He also did the same experiment, but instead of putting in two egg nuclei, he put two sperm nuclei in. Now, in both cases, if you had the two egg nuclei, the two egg nuclei fused and development started but then it just stopped and went horribly wrong. If you put in the two sperm nuclei, the nuclei fused, development started, went horribly wrong, stopped. But if you put in the egg nucleus and the sperm nucleus and you re-implanted baby mice. The really elegant, beautiful thing about his work was that he set it up so that all three conditions were absolutely genetically identical. Whether it was two egg nuclei or two sperm nuclei or an egg nucleus and a sperm nucleus, the DNA in those three experimental conditions was exactly the same. This showed us something absolutely extraordinary. It showed us that mammalian reproduction is not just dependent on genetics. It's dependent on something else as well. We are all masterpieces of epigenetics, but we are all absolutely dependent on epigenetics. Not one of us would exist if it weren't for epigenetics. Because in mammals, DNA in certain key regions comes marked with its parent of origin. It has epigenetic modifications on it that basically say, this copy of the gene has come from mum, or this copy of the gene has come from dad. You have to have that, or you cannot get new young created. There's probably about 100 bits in the human genome where this happens. Sometimes you get individuals born whose genetics are perfectly fine, but their epigenetics has gone wrong. So in a key region of the genome, instead of both one copy saying, I'm from mum and one from, I'm from dad, epigenetically, you can get individuals who they have exactly the right DNA, but both copies say, I'm from mum, or both copies say, I'm from dad. So when this happens, we have what are called imprinting disorders, because this process of, I'm from mum, I'm from dad, is called imprinting. Um, this little girl has something called um, Angelman syndrome. She's very small in stature. She has um, severe learning disabilities, very distinct behavioral phenotypes. This young man has something called Prader-Willi syndrome, very big stature, huge tendency to obesity, again, severe learning disability, again, very um, marked behavioral phenotypes. If any of you ever watch any of the reality programs with the model Jordan, her son Harvey, who has a disability, that's what he has, Prader-Willi syndrome. Both of these children, their DNA is absolutely fine. It's the epigenetic modifications they inherited on the DNA that have gone severely wrong. And actually, it's in the same region. It's just that one of them has two copies of I'm from dad and one has two copies of I'm from mum. So really severe phenotypes. But from all of these data, we can generate a quite interesting hypothesis. We know that epigenetic information is passed on from parent to child. It has to be. None of us would exist without it. 
We also know that epigenetic information is influenced by the environment. You remember the sugar coming into your system. So if epigenetic information is passed on from parent to child, which it is, and if epigenetic information can be influenced by the environment, that leads to a really straightforward hypothesis. Maybe parents could pass on epigenetic responses to the environment to their offspring. That seems perfectly reasonable based on those other bits of data. It's considered absolute heresy. And it's considered heresy because that would be an example of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Before Darwin came up with his theory of natural selection, which is a beautiful, fantastic, marvelous theory, I'm well on side with Darwin, there was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, the guy with the excellent sideburns. He was trying to explain why species may have developed, and he said, well, if we think about the ancestral species to the giraffe, when they were roaming the plains, those animals would have stretched upwards to pick the leaves. And that would have stretched their necks in the same way you get bigger muscles if you go to the gym a lot. They'll have stretched their necks and they'll pass on that adaptation to their offspring. Now, of course, once we had the Darwinian Mendelian model, we thought, well, this is clearly nonsense. What's actually happening is some animals naturally had longer necks. They were at an advantage because they could eat more. They passed on that advantage to their offspring. Um, and I cannot tell you how deeply heretical and unfashionable it has always been to say, do you know, occasionally maybe Lamarck was onto something, but he was. And there are increasing amounts of data showing that this is the case. It's not an alternative to Darwinian evolution, it's just a very small and interesting addition to it. And this is my favorite example. Um, it's my favorite example, though, if you're a mouse or a rat, you don't always have the best of times in epigenetics. What they did was they took male mice and they exposed them to the smell of cherry blossom. And each time they exposed them to the smell of cherry blossom, they then gave the mice a little electric shock. If you do this a lot, the mouse learns to associate the smell of cherry blossom with an electric shock, with something unpleasant happening. It's a classic conditioning experiment. And after a while, every time you give them the smell of cherry blossom, they will shake with fear, as I think would I, to be perfectly honest, because they're expecting an electric shock. So they did that. Then they let those male mice breed. And they exposed their offspring to the smell of cherry blossom. And their offspring shook with fear. They had never once had an electric shock. But they had inherited from their parent the knowledge somehow that the smell of cherry blossom meant something really awful was about to happen to you. The thing that was so elegant about these experiments was that the scientists knew exactly which gene to look for, exactly which brain cells to look for. So they looked in particular brain cells at particular genes and showed that there was a, this conditioning created a pattern of epigenetic modifications in the brain of the parents, and that somehow this same pattern had become established in their offspring. It's a very elegant, very well-designed experiment. It does still need to be repeated by another lab because these things are always controversial. Um, and to give you an idea of how controversial they are, or rather how complicated they are, I'll give you one more example. So again, a mouse having a very, very bad life. Basically, scientists took a mouse and they traumatized it, right? And the easiest way to traumatize a mouse is to leave a small mouse in a cage with a bigger mouse. Mice are cowards, okay? If a mouse is feeling outgunned, it will run away. But if it's locked in a cage with a big mouse, it can't run away. And the little mouse becomes really miserable and unhappy and it stops grooming and it stops eating and it's a really, really terrible excuse for a mouse. And then, then it had a lucky day. Researchers reach in, pick out the mouse, take him to another cage, drop him in a cage with a sexually receptive female. Okay, finally, his dreams have come true. He's away from the big scary mouse, he's having sex. Okay? So they mate, and all of the offspring were really runty and undersized. And the researchers published this, and they said his, trans his trauma has been epigenetically transmitted to his offspring. 
perfectly sensible interpretation, almost certainly wrong. Another bunch of experimenters looked at this and thought, I don't think so. So they repeated the experiment, but with one really important difference. You remember I said, that, you know, lift out little mouse, say, lucky day, mate, you're going in a cage with a female. Well, not so lucky day, lifted out the mouse, got his semen. I don't even want to think about how you do that, okay? Because that is a really strange day at work. <laughs> okay? Took his semen, artificially inseminated the female, so she never saw him. And when she gave birth, all of the offspring were perfectly normal size. They were not runty at all. He had not epigenetically transmitted her, his trauma. She had just noticed that she was being mated with this really substandard mouse and somehow or other restricted the supply of nutrients to the offspring on the ground. She really wasn't going to invest in these much because hopefully a better one would come along. Okay? We don't know how she does that. Um, now, I have no idea. I know, gosh, this seems to be striking a chord with a lot of you. I have no idea what would be the age-appropriate equivalent, but certainly for women my age, the example I would give would be, I ordered George Clooney and they sent me Danny DeVito. You know, it's just like, <laughs> really? So it gives you an idea of just how careful you have to be when you do these experiments. And actually, you have to be careful about interpreting a lot in epigenetics. You're all at the stage in your careers and your scientific progress where you're going to be exposed to more and more epigenetic stuff, either in the newspapers or magazines or in scientific papers themselves, and ridiculous claims will be made. So I'm going to give you some hints on how to apply some common sense rules. The first is to remember that genetics and epigenetics work together. Scientists are really dumb. We do this thing of constantly going, no, no, it's my field that's important. No, it's my field. No, it's my field. Genetics and epigenetics work together, okay? If you take away either bit, life becomes impossible. Um, cells don't think in the way that our brains do. Cells don't try and form sides, okay? Stuff works together. Just because you see an association between two things, it does not imply causation. One of the biggest risk factors ever reported for lung cancer is carrying a box of matches in your pocket. It is not that the chemicals in matches give you lung cancer. But if you're carrying matches, you're very likely to be a smoker. Um, drowning deaths peak at exactly the same time that sales of ice cream peak. It does not mean that people developed cramps because they ate too much ice cream. It does not mean anyone is swimming to get some ice cream. It's just they both happen at the same time because it's summer. Okay? So association does not imply causation. So you may see an epigenetic change in an experimental system. It's much more difficult to prove that that caused the change that you see. Almost everything will have an epigenetic effect if you look hard enough. You've all changed epigenetically sitting here. I've changed epigenetically walking up and down doesn't mean those changes are good or bad. Also means that you'll quite frequently find statistically significant changes. That doesn't mean that things are biologically relevant. Okay, watch out for this. You'll see this all the time. Somebody does an experiment and they finally come up with some minuscule thing which is statistically significant. Doesn't mean it has any biological meaning. Just try and apply the common sense test. So watch out for stuff like that. Watch out to see if experiments really make sense. If somebody's looking at an effect in the brain and all their analyses have been done in the skin or the blood cells, ooh, look at that, <laughs> then um, may not matter because it may not be relevant. They're not looking at the right tissue. There's loads more I could tell you about epigenetics, but clearly the gods of PowerPoint have decided I shouldn't, which is fine. Um, let's think. If it weren't for epigenetics, it would be impossible to clone animals. But it's because of epigenetics that cloning doesn't work very well. Um, all tortoiseshell cats are female. And in fact, all female life depends on epigenetics because women have two X chromosomes. We have to switch one of them off. And the way we do that is by smothering it with epigenetic modifications that turn it off forever. Oh, thank you. Um, epigenetics plays a role in aging. It's not the only thing, but it is important. Um, epigenetics is very well established in plants. And actually, all that stuff about inheriting epigenetic changes, 
plant scientists are perfectly happy with that. They've known about it for years. They don't care. They think all of us people who work in animals are just having a fuss for no particular reason. Um, honeybees. Queen honeybees and worker honeybees, if you extract the DNA and sequence it, you can't tell which was the queen and which was the worker. That phenotype is completely dependent on how the animal, the bees feed at a particular time in development. But the effects that that has, three extra days of feeding on royal jelly, are extraordinary. Queen honeybees are completely different from workers. One of the main ways in which they differ is that queens will live 20 times as long. If you put that into human terms, then we are halfway through the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the first. That's how big the difference is, and it's epigenetic. So there's loads of things I could tell you, but we're happily out of time. But if you ever wanted to find out more, you can always read my books, shameless plug. I do always like to see a little spike in sales after these events. Um, and although I have read the safeguarding certificate that says the state uh, leaflet that they forced on me when I signed in here, um, that says never tell the students how to reach you, it's really easy to find me online anyway, so you can. So if you ever have any questions, <laughs> um, do please just get in touch. And thank you all for your attention. You've been great.